Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. I'm your sensei, <laughs> Nicholas Tyson. Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope the, the first exam, which I realized was now a couple of weeks ago, but I hope you guys are keeping on track with all of your readings and your work. I know it's rough. I know it's difficult to sort of like force yourself to, to do things when you don't have like the regular classes to keep you on task, but I'm extremely lenient <laughs> when it comes to due dates. I basically ignore them. Um, again, the only hard and fast deadline is um, my midterm grade report. So do try to get caught up at least by then. But if you're not, if you're having trouble, if you know, like you need assistance, if you need explanation, please email me ASAP so we can figure out a strategy for how to help you along. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about fiction. So let me get my outline brought up again. Okay, so right here, the earliest Japanese prose fiction. So let's, let's define all of these words. <laughs> We're going to have to do that. So by earliest, we mean not the absolute earliest, but you know, sort of when, when prose fiction in Japanese was starting to become a thing and not just sort of like little snippets of like written folk tales that you find here and there. Um, Japanese, um, if you go all the way back to our very first lecture, you will remember why Japanese is a problematic term. But again, we're talking about the, the Yamato Damashi, as it were, <laughs> that conception of the Japanese polity. Prose, as opposed to poetry, that one's pretty straightforward, and fiction, meaning it's made up. Now, the made up part is actually important here because when we were back when we were talking about the Kojiki, even though it, most of it is mythological or legendary in character, they didn't really think of it as being made up. Here, they know the stories are more or less not true. They're, they're fiction. They're made up. And though your reading for today identifies really sort of two vectors of origin for Japanese prose fiction, I would argue that there are actually three. And so when I've taught Japanese, pre-modern Japanese literature in the past, or when I've taught, say, like the tale of Genji or, or Monogotari, as it's called in Japanese, in any form, I always emphasize three vectors. Now, this is all, there's probably more than this, but to me, these are the three important vectors and sort of for the sake of keeping it to a comprehensible limit, these are the three that I want you to remember. So the first one is folklore, so folk tales. Now these are mostly of mixed origin. And the reason why they're of mixed origin is because they primarily come from an oral tradition. In other words, these are stories that long before they were ever written down were passed from one individual to another through speech through you know, one person telling another person. So as you can imagine, when it comes to stories that are sort of told in this manner, they vary wildly. It's also difficult to pinpoint what aspect of them is specifically Japanese and what is sort of drawn from um, other traditions. Uh, for example, there's a sort of long-standing argument in um, Japanese folklore studies as to whether or not the one of the, the texts you had to read today, the tale of the woodcutter, the um, Taketori Monogatari, actually shows fairly clear similarities to certain Tibetan folk tales. And so it's wondered if you know one influenced the other, or if they, as they say in evolutionary biology, if they share a common origin, something like that. In other words, there's pretty clear indications that a lot of what you see in these folk tales comes from somewhere else. And specifically, sort of the, the, the sort of the feather robe motif, that appears in much, much earlier works that have nothing to do with the Takatona Morogatari. Um, also, the idea of sort of like a heavenly creature sort of coming down, living amongst mortals. This is a common motif in folklore really throughout the world. And so that's, and that's another, that's, that's another point, is that like sort of, it's hard to pinpoint elements in folk traditions precisely because they seem to be common to the human experience, at least on this planet. Um, for example, the, like the testing the suitors, the five suitors that you see in the um, tale of the bamboo cutter, um, like that you see all over the place. <laughs> you see it in European folk tales, you see it in, you know, American folk tales, you see it in African folk tales, Asian, like it's all over the place. Like it's a common thing because marriage rights and sort of like 
tests and trials associated with marriage seem to be common to literally all human societies. Um, the other thing, important thing to note about Japanese folklore, and this is, to me, this is really interesting, is that Japanese folk traditions are not even consistent with themselves. This is, now this goes back to um, a point that I made a long time ago about Japanese quote-unquote culture, is that it's not a unified thing. Um, so, for example, in the um, Taketori Monogatari, so uh, Kaguya Hime comes from the moon, and yet, you know, we read in an earlier text in the Kojiki that there is this moon god who is descended from Susano, um, called Tsukuyomi. No, sorry, not, not from Susano, from Izanagi, sorry. So you have, the, you have the triune sort of system. You have Amaterasu, you have Susano, and you have Tsukuyomi. Tsukuyomi is sort of the lesser important moon god and gets no mention at all in this Japanese folk tale. So clearly there are sort of multiple inconsistent folk traditions in Japan at this time and previous. So you, you generally have to sort of accept the internal logic of the tale that you're looking at rather than try to sort of like homogenize it with other things that exist, which is what the Kojiki tried to do. But in many ways, Japanese folklore resists this. So the second major vector for um, a prose fiction tradition in Japan are, it actually comes from poetry, strangely enough. And poetry is actually an extremely important. In fact, it's probably central, particularly when it comes to later texts like the, the Tale of Genji. Um, really, these, these poetic headnotes that you see in um, anthologies are really sort of a primary vector. And so you can sort of see this in the relationship between um, these two poems, number 645 and 646 in the Kokinshu, and um, episode number 69, <laughs> nice, <laughs> in the Ise Morgatari, or the, the Tales of Ise. So let's take a look first in the, the Kokinshu, where it's hard to describe this as, as a story, as a narrative. It's really just kind of a context. It's just a t contextual. It's just an explanation, like a preface. So it's a, and it's pretty thin on details. When Narihira, so that's um, Ariwara no Narihira no Ason, so Lord Ariwara no Narihira, visited the province of Ise, he met secretly the person who was serving as the high priestess. The next morning, before he was able to find a way to send her a message, this poem was delivered from the woman. You get the poem. We talked about this last time. We talked about this poem last time, but we're going to talk about it again when I actually get into the details of the the Issei story. And then it says, you know, in the following one, reply. And then it gives Narihira's reply to the, the high priestess, the, the shrine maiden at Issei. So, you know, as a, as a story, there's not much there. But this bit here sort of serves as the skeleton upon which a larger vignette is built. And I believe I have an actual discussion of that. So I don't know if I want to talk too more about much more about it now. Yeah, okay, I talk about it down there. All right. So but so bear that in mind that like there is there so that information is then going to serve as the basis for this um vignette we will look at later. And so because of this, it's important to note that in many ways, early Japanese poetry, sorry, prose fiction actually emerges from poetry meaning the poetry is central. So when you see poems in later monogatari and later prose texts, the poetry is not just this like nice addition. It's not just sort of like a way of kind of decorating the text with flowery language. It's more like the, the prose narrative serves the same function for those poems and those texts as the, the prose text you see in the, the Kokinshu. It's sort of prefacing the poems. The poems have a central function in the text. They're not just sort of added on. So the third major vector I want to talk about are chronicles and diaries. So there's this word in Japanese, the common modern Japanese word for a diary or a journal is the word nikki. Um, literally a daily record. You know, you can see, for those of you who speak Chinese at least, you see day record. <laughs> so a daily record. But in Japan, this originally referred to something like a le daily ledger in the imperial household. So it was like, you know, today this person showed up and did X. Um, today this person gave this per thing to this person. Like, you know, it, it's more just a record. It's, it's just sort of record keeping. That's why I described it as like a ledger. Um, but in time, even in the Heian period, the, this term Niki 
comes to refer to something like a daily journal, but almost like a literary journal. And you have a lot of really sort of like important literary figures, especially women. Now, this is really important, especially women, especially female figures who are writing these daily journals as a kind of prose text, a kind of literary text. Um, sometimes they're fictional, and we'll see a fictional example. In fact, the only Niki in this period that we're going to be reading is um, the Tulsa Niki. Um, and they have a very clearly like narrative quality to them. Uh, I should also note that today's, so I, I didn't actually break up today's video. Maybe I will. Maybe when I get to the, maybe I'll take a break for myself <laughs> when, I, when I get to um, the uh, Tales, Tales of Visa. But I'm trying to try and do this as one whole video. So also, okay, so there's this, also this notion of the past. So these texts begin with this word. So most monogatari begin with this term, mukash. And in fact, in modern Japanese, like when you're telling like fairy tales or folk tales, oftentimes they begin mukash, mukash. So it's like, you know, a long time ago or in the past or, you know, in a previous age. Um, your translators here prefer the phrase, I believe they prefer uh, I guess many years ago for the bamboo cutter, but um, it's they use in the past for, sorry, uh, the Ise Monogatari. Um, it's not quite as distant, though, as like in a long time ago. It's more like, um, as, as I note here, it's more appropriate to think of Mukashi as being like in a previous age, like in... in or, or like when an old man, or as I note below here, like when, when someone, when an old person says, oh, back in my day, we used to, like, that's the sense of mukashi here. It's something that may actually be within the lived experience of the oldest people in your society, but there is this sense of like, you know, somehow, like things in ye olden times were better. And that's an important point, like that the past was somehow better than the modern age, because it's related to this Buddhist concept of the, so there, there are these three Buddhist ages, and the last of which, the sort of the degenerate age in Japanese is referred to as the mapol, and literally it means sort of like the last or the final law. When supposedly, and so this, this character here in both Chinese and Japanese is used to translate the Indian word, so the Sanskrit word dharma. And so the, the mapol is the period in which sort of the, the dharma, the sort of the cosmological force that sort of governs things is considered to be in decline. And so anything that's prior to now then will generally be considered to be better because it's sort of prior to the, the current decline. So there's the sense that you see in prose texts, particularly in this period, and also in later periods as well, that sort of the age in which people are living is a degenerate one, and that things in the past were somehow better. Now, getting into the two texts you actually had to read for today. So the first of which is the Tale of the Bamboo Cutter. In, Japanese. in fact, it's important to remember this, this Japanese term, monogatari. Um, we're going to be talking about two types of monogatari today. Um, this is sort of the, the Japanese. This is a, the, the division I'm going to use today is the one that Japanese scholars use. I don't, I have problems with it, but you know, it's important to learn these divisions because it's sort of the consensus of how these things are understood. So the, the first of the two types is what is, this is usually translated as a fabricated tale or a made up tale. So in Japanese, the term is tsukuri monogatari. Um, tsukuri from the verb tsukuru meaning like to make or to fabricate or to make up as we say in English. So this is like, yeah, this is, you know, a make-believe tale, if you will. So the word monogatari, as I note here in item one, uh, originally meant something like idle chit-chat. It literally means like relating or narrating things to someone, like mono, things, and then katari from the verb kataru meaning to relate or to narrate. So the idea is here is um, to emphasize the sort of oral quality of narratives. That you're sort of sitting around, you've got nothing better to do. Maybe you're sitting around a campfire, or maybe you're hanging out in your ladies' quarters or whatever, and you tell stories as a way to sort of pass the time. It is an idle pastime. And this is really important because, as I note in item two here, um, monogatari are really of and by and for the aristocracy. I mean, the, because these are, well, one, because they're the only literate people in the society. 
um, but also because they're the ones with the greatest amount of leisure time. In other words, they're the ones who have the time to sit around and just speak to each other in poems or to exchange like flower branches with sprays of flowers with poems attached to them and to make up stories of these kind of this kind so okay there are two aspects of the tale of the bamboo cutter that i want to emphasize the first is this sort of thinking of it as an allegory of exile and then we'll get into talking about sort of the more, more like folk tale like elements so first this allegory of exile. So the basic premise, and what's interesting about this is that, so at the beginning of the story, let's just take a look at it, the beginning of the story. So the very beginning of the story, you've got an old dude called the old bamboo cutter, um, literally the <laughs> Taketori no Okina. Okina is like old man. It's an old, it's just an archaic term for old man. Every day he would make his way into the fields and mountains to gather bamboo, which he fashioned into all manner of wares. His name was Saniki no Miyako. One day he noticed among the bamboos a stalk that glowed at the base. He thought this was very strange, and going over to have a look, saw a light that was shining inside the hollow stem. He examined it, and there he found a most lovely little girl about three inches tall. Actually, um, sort of the tradition... It says three inches tall here, but the tradition is that Kaguyahime is supposedly the size of his thumb. The old man said, I have discovered you because you were here. Among these bamboos I watch over every morning and evening. It must be you are meant to be my child. And we'll talk about this statement in a little bit. So he goes out into the woods to cut down some bamboo, probably to make charcoal generally. Bamboo in this time was both used to make stuff, but it was also primarily used as a fuel source. So going back to our thing here, the uh, Kaguya Hime, which literally means like the shining princess, she's sent from the moon supposedly as a punishment for some sins. We don't find this out actually until the very end of the text, but if you read it, you know this. So spoilers. You can't spoil something that's thousand years old that seems silly so to live amongst mortals and as a and as a result of this punishment she actually starts to sympathize with them and feel for them and so there's this transformation of like the celestial creature into someone who is more mortal and then at the end of the story when she transforms back into a celestial creature how that sort of mortality is shed um it's reminiscent of the sort of the heaven earth duality that we saw um in earlier japanese literature but also um, it has a kind of thin Buddhist, I guess you could say, cast to it. Um, so like the idea of, you know, a sinful creature, like being sort of like the idea that, you know, your, your karma takes you into the world as a result of your sins. And then you sort of, by, by, by finally like completing the karmic cycle, you then escape from it and you become a heavenly creature again and you forget all about your worldly cares. Um, but what's interesting about the uh, tale of the bamboo cutter is sort of the way in which Kaguya Hime, though a heavenly creature, actually takes pity on humanity. She forms this like special bond with the the emperor. They never actually like have a, a sexual or, or a romantic relationship, but she does feel closely like bound to him and tries to actually share her divine nature with him. So when the the Mooney people come down what page is this 127 so when the mooney people come down to retrieve her apologies i should have well no i needed to look at that bit up there first uh, let's see um there's the bit at the end where i mean we'll all talk about this in, in a sec so when she comes when the mooney people come down to to retrieve her um, one of the moon dudes hands her the elixir of immortality because he, he says right up here, you must be feeling unwell after the things. Well, actually, I'll just read it. Um, some of the celestial beings had brought boxes with them. One contained a robe of feathers, another the elixir of immortality. He says, quote, please take some of the elixir in this jar, said a celestial being to Kaguya Hime. You must be feeling unwell after the things you have had to eat in this dirty place. Again, the sort of the dirty terrestrial, like, you know, the Buddhist allegories. Like I said, pretty obvious. He offered her the elixir, and Kaguya Hime tasted a little. Then, thinking she might leave a little as a remembrance of herself, she started to wrap some of the elixir in the cloak she had discarded when a celestial being prevented her. And then she does actually end up giving some, uh, as you see further down, 
some of the the elixir of immortality to the emperor but the emperor actually refuses to drink it because there is this like sense that by becoming an immortal creature like her he will sort of forget about the the specialness of his relationship with this woman and how beautiful and special she was and again this sort of goes back to this um, aesthetic that we saw in the kokinshu where um, there is value in things that are not permanent. There, there is value. There is beauty to be had in things that don't last. And sort of, we see that principle emphasized again here at the end of this tale. Now let's get on to the folk tale elements. Okay, one old people. <laughs> um, this is something you see again and again and again and again in Japanese folk tales and folklore. In fact, it's probably most its most famous version is in the the story of Momotaro. You know, where two or an old couple with no children who sort of have done what they were supposed to do their entire lives are very, very, very late in life gifted with a child. And Kaguya Hime is, over the course of the tale, very clearly presented as sort of a gift to these, these two old people, not just as, as a daughter herself, as someone, you know, as a companion, someone for them to take care of, but also because um, the moon people keep sending gold nuggets <laughs> in, in other bamboo stalks to them. And so the old man and woman become extremely wealthy as a result of all this money that the moon people send them to take care of her. And you see this on page 115. I, I already noted this line, but I'll repeat it. I've discovered, he, so the old man says to um, the newly born Kaguya Hime, I have discovered you because you were here among these bamboos I watch over every morning and evening. So there's the sense that he is being rewarded for performing his duty of care, or more specifically, like because he has accepted his proper place in the world and um, done his duty diligently, he is now being rewarded as a result. So again, this is a common folklore motif, like old people who have done right their entire lives in some way being rewarded by the gift of a child. Um, another common motif you see in a lot of folklore, and, and as I noted earlier, in like folklore throughout the world, is, are these suitors. So oftentimes you see this in the form of like some like incredibly desired woman and then all the local princes and dukes and marquises and whatnot they hear about her existence and they come to her, they're enamored with her beauty. And then she or her father sets some sort of impossible task for the suitor to um, accomplish as a means to test his worth. That's sort of the more common trope. Um, in this instance, the, the tasks are so impossible that it, it's more meant to just put them off. Kaguya Hime. So this is, this is actually sort of like the Buddhist inflection of this idea. You know, in the traditional, sort of in the more common version of this type of like suitor story, like generally one, emerge, one actually performs the impossible task and, um, and emerges as the one who was most worthy and then they get married and they live happily ever after, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here, that's actually not the purpose of the tale. The purpose of the tale is to actually keep Kaguya Hime from becoming more attached to these worldly desires. Again, this is sort of the, the, the Buddhist overtones of this. Ultimately, by returning to being a celestial being, she serves as an allegory for like escaping worldly cares, worldly interests, and all the things about daily life that sort of weigh down your consciousness and sort of build up karma. Um, and so you see this on um, page 116, where even though she's, tr and this is an important point, where even though she's trying to, you know, put these guys off at the same time, so, th so this is the, this isn't the Buddhist part, this is sort of the Confucian aspect of it, which sort of implies either that there's a, like a Chinese origin to this tale or that there's, this is sort of like um, an inflection as a result of the influence of Chinese culture. Okay, it's right here. The old man, observing their ardor, which is to say the, 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 the suitors who had come to like try and get Kaguya Hime to be the wife, observing their ardor said to Kaguya Hime, my precious child, I realize you are divinity in human form, but I've spared no efforts to raise you in such a great raise you into such a great fine lady will you not listen to what an old man has to say and then this is the important part kaguya hime replied what request could you make of me to which i would not consent <laughs> 
You say I am a divinity in human form, but I know nothing of that. I think of you and you alone as my father. So it's not just like, oh, hey, you're, you're my dad. I like you. You're great. But this idea, so it begins with like, what requests could you make of me to which I would not consent? This goes back to the sort of Confucian notion of filial piety that, you know, children are to obey their parents and to do their duty to their parents just as their parents do their duty to like whatever role they have in society. So we have, you know, the, the, the Buddhist aspects of this, but then also here we see the, the more sort of Confucian aspects of it. Okay, and so the last thing I want to talk about from the, the selections from the Tale of the Bamboo Cutter is this robe of feathers. So the section that begins with, that deals with the robe of feathers and also the elixir of immortality begins with the situation in which the, the emperor is completely smitten with this woman, Kaguya Hime. He's totally in love with her, but she has, she likes him because she continues to sort of write letters to him. Um, and they have a kind of distant relationship, if you will. But she has, so it says at the beginning, they pass some three years in this way, each consoling the other. At the beginning of the next spring, Kaguya seemed more pensive than usual. She watched the moon rise in all its splendor. So in this last section of the tale, this is the, la this is the end of the tale. She starts to get more and more fond of the moon. Now that she has accomplished this task of sort of like pushing off the suitors and then sort of allegorically like pushing away her desires, pushing away like earthly concerns, she starts to look to the moon as this like distant symbol and sort of this thing that she is now like aspiring to and her thoughts are less and less of the world. And so it eventually gets to a point where um, the moon people are going to come down and retrieve Kaguya Hime finally because she now wants to return. She says, I have a father and mother who live in the city of the moon. When I came here from, from my country, I said it would be just for a short while, but already I've spent many years in this land. I have tarried among you without thinking of my parents on the moon, and I've become accustomed to your ways. Now that I am about to return, I feel no great joy, but only a terrible sadness. And yet, though it is not by my choice, I must go. So now here you see again, sort of like the, the sort of the Confucian aspects of this tale reasserting themselves. She recognizes that she has a duty to her quote unquote real father and mother in the city of the moon. And now she must return because whereas previously in dealing in sort of entertaining the suitors, she was doing her duty to her adopted father, the, the old bamboo cutter. Now she has to do her final duty to her father and mother on the moon by returning. So when the moon people come down to retrieve Kaguya Hime, the emperor doesn't want this to happen. So he orders a bunch of men to try and fight the moon people and stop them. Um, they can't because they're mortals and the moon people are moon people. Um, they're just super awesome. They're not only super strong, but they're also incredibly beautiful. You see this on page 126. Words cannot describe the beauty of the raiment worn by the men who hovered in the air. With them, they had brought a flying chariot covered by a parasol of gauzy silk. So not only are they like super awesome fighters, they're also hot. So, you know, you just can't, <laughs> you can't win with the moon people. And then at the very, very end of the tale, um, so, like, as I noted earlier, she receives, so there's the celestial boxes, and then one contains a robe of feathers, another the, the elixir of immortality. Um, the sort of putting on the, the, the feathered robe is sort of a kind of emblematic of, of, of an ascension, or say, like, you know, the, if you want to look at that, this from a Buddhist perspective, like the achievement of nirvana, the return and ultimately for her in the story, a return to being one of these beautiful celestial beings instead of just like a, you know, really pretty woman. It says, um, do, 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 do. no sooner had the commander accepted the elixir, which is the, the elixir that is going to be passed on to the emperor, than the celestial being put the robe of feathers on Kaguya Hime. At once she lost all recollection of the pity and grief she had felt for the old man. So putting on this robe, like all of her, Earthly attachments are just immediately shed. They immediately go away. No cares afflict anyone 
who once puts on this robe, and Kaguyahime, in all tranquility, climbed into her chariot and ascended into the sky, accompanied by a retinue of a hundred celestial beings. So here, it, I mean, there it is. I mean, that, that, this bit right here, this is sort of like an allegory of like, you know, B Buddhist ascension in a nutshell. It's, it's right there. But it's told as, you know, sort of this kind of fantastical narrative. And so it's not just like a description of the literal experience of sort of achieving this freedom from samsara. Here it is dramatized. You see, or see it happening with some beautiful celestial robe and this like heavenly creature and this chariot that goes up to the moon. You know, it's got all those folktale elements, but it has this sort of like Buddhist underlayer to it. And it's really important to keep that in mind as you're sort of reading the end of the story. But the story, interestingly, does not end with Kaguya Hime. It actually ends with the mortal creatures back on Earth. And I just want to read this final paragraph. So he receives the elixir and he says, what use is it, this elixir of immortality, to one who floats in tears because he cannot meet her again. He gave the poem and the jar containing the elixir to a messenger with the command that he take them to the summit of the mountain in Suruga. He directed that the letter and the jar be placed side by side, set on fire, and allowed to be consumed in the flames. The men obeying this command climbed the mountain, taking with them a great many soldiers. Ever since they burned the elixir of mortality on the summit, people have called the mountain by the name Fuji, meaning immortal. Even now, the smoke is still said to rise into the clouds. So there you have it. It's this sort of like, again, it's the, it's the heaven-earth connection. So the, sort of this elixir of immortality is taken to Mount Fuji. And I'm not going to explain. It's covered in a footnote. There's this elaborate explanation for why, like Fushi and Fuji. I'm not going to get into it. Um, but again, sort of like there's a literal connection here, sort of like by burning the elixir of immortality and its smoke rising up into the air, sort of that creates a literal connection between the earth, between the mountain and the heavens where um, Kaguya Hime now dwells. All right, I think I actually am going to pause here. So um, stop share for a second. Um, I will be back in a little bit. I'm going to sort of take a breather and try and get my voice back. 